about the opportunity that I have tonight. We have three couples that are important to us that are engaged to get married uh, too far down the line. And, and so I wanted to take advantage of an opportunity to say some things, especially to them, but really to us all, as I talk about the subject of marriage and, and happiness. It's certainly an important subject, especially if you're thinking about getting married. And so I wanted to say some things that would serve as an exhortation uh, to these three couples. And so that exhortation is, is this, don't get married if you want to be happy. <laughs> and so now that I have your attention, uh, let me explain what I mean by that. And first of all, I'd like to point out that this is by Byron and Adrian Smith. So she agrees with me in what I'm uh, going to be saying. And so if you have a problem with my lesson, you can go see her. <laughs> but... Uh, so if you want to be happy, don't get married. So what do I mean by that? This is not a cynical suggestion from a cranky old grunt that's sour on life. It is actually a carefully contemplated proposition. And I'm not suggesting that a couple cannot be happily married. Uh, they can. And they should aspire to that marital goal. In fact, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 5 and verse 18, to rejoice, men to rejoice in the wife of your youth. And Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 9 tells us to live joyfully uh, with the, 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 the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that Lord, the Lord has given you under the sun. And so uh, live joyfully and rejoice. And so that is in relation to this person that you have married. And so I'm not suggesting that a couple cannot be happy. Rather, I am suggesting that there are safer and sounder and more sensible motivations to, to take the plunge. Let me illustrate that by comparing it to something that is unrelated. That being a, uh, a medical doctor who became such simply to be rich. Becoming a doctor can be a, and is, I think, a noble ambition. Uh, there, are li uh, there are many legitimate mo motivations. One might become a doctor to heal, to serve, and to comfort. But what if the sole motive of a person becoming a doctor is they just want to become rich since wealth is often associated with being a doctor? And so we can see, I think, in that, that such a superficial basis for their choice will not likely end well. It will actually very likely hinder their ability to fulfill their real duties as a doctor and ultimately impact their overall success. And so if one's highest uh, objective to matrimony is happiness, that's why they're doing I just want to be happy and that's it. They are sure to be disappointed sooner or later or to one degree or another. Marriage like life, it comes with very significant challenges and requires our unreserved attention uh, and dedication. And again, marriage like life it is unpredictable. Sometimes it presents uh, satisfactions, but sometimes it uh, delivers disappointments. And so, uh, we need to be aware of that. This is, I think, even indicated in the common uh, marriage vows, the wedding vows for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. That indicates that it can go either direction. And so, if one's goal is nothing more than happiness, and they get the, the, uh, the worse, they become the poorer, and they they become sick, they are likely to face devastation. However, if one's goals in, in, in marriage are higher, then they can take the good with the bad and they can build a marriage that is stable and that is lasting and that is truly uh, happy. I might compare marrying someone just to be happy to marrying someone just because they're good looking. Some people do that. 
They fall in love with, or they think they fall in love with someone. Well, they're so good looking. I think happiness is on par with good looks. If you're marrying someone simply because they're good looking, things are going to eventually go south. Literally. Eventually, hair is going to fall out. It's going to go south. The eyelids are going to droop and the pecs are going to plummet. Things are going to literally go south. And so maybe it is that you find some that you're, someone you're wanting to marry and they are good looking and they're also a very good person. Uh, those good looks are a bonus, but they are a fading reality. And so assuming a favorable uh, situation exists between, between two scripturally eligible individuals, they are contemplating this union of, of marriage what are some valid motivations for matrimony? And, and for those of us who, well, we're not considering, being, uh, considering marrying someone when we're already married, we might look at it from this point of view. What should be important to me in a marriage? Me as a husband, what kind of husband should I be? You as a wife, what kind of wife should you be? And so for those three couples that... Uh, are not yet married, you can look at it from this point of view. Valid motivations for matrimony and the rest of us, what kind of person should I be in marriage? And so the first valid motivation for matrimony, I would suggest is this, and this is foremost, that this person is a faithful Christian who will help me to get to heaven. I have long insisted to my children that what is most important in life, number one, is to become a Christian. That is to obey the Gospel. That is most important in your life. And number two is that you be a Christian. That is that you live as a faithful child of God in His service. And number three, that you marry a Christian. That is one who is genuinely committed to God. And I firmly believe that these are the three most important things in life and that if my children get these things right, I know I'm satisfied and I believe that they'll have things taken care of. That everything else will just kind of fall in place. And so marry a Christian. A faithful Christian. Someone who again is genuinely committed to God. The wisdom in doing this, I do not believe, can be overstated. And the foolishness of doing otherwise, I do not believe, can be exaggerated. You need to marry a faithful Christian. Someone who will help you in your quest for heaven. Someone who will help you to live closer to God. An eligible Christian individual, they have every right to pursue such a marriage. And we certainly should not discourage it if they have found someone that has proved themselves to be a faithful Christian Serving the Lord as they should, they have that right. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, to take along a believing spouse as Peter. Paul would say that. Don't we have that right as well to take about a believing spouse? They have that right to do as the, the, the widow who's lost her husband has the right to marry, but only in the Lord is... Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39, such a person, that faithful Christian, will encourage and assist them in their quest for heaven. And I think evidence of this will be given as we go through this lesson of how they will help you in getting to heaven. A spiritually mature Christian has good reason to, to avoid doing otherwise. To avoid marrying someone who is not a faithful Christian, God warned and God commanded Israel of old regarding the intermarriage of themselves with the Gentiles, saying that they will turn your heart and your sons away from following Me. The Lord didn't even say they might do this. The Lord said, for they will turn your sons away from following Me. But if... We know the history of Israel. We know that they disobeyed with disheartening and disastrous results. They intermarried with those Gentiles and they did lead them astray. 
And instead of serving the one true God of heaven, they bow before idols, the people of God bowing before idols. Why? Because they disobey God and they intermarried among those Gentiles. And those Gentiles did lead them astray. And similar outcomes today are replicated when children of God marry children of the devil. If you are a child of God, you've responded to the Gospel, and you marry someone who has not responded to the Gospel, they're not a child of God, they are a child of the devil, and so you have a child of God marrying a child of the devil. The outcome very often is, is not good. And so to marry a Christian is to marry someone who has the highest aspiration. And that aspiration is heaven, as Paul would say to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 of, of us, how we should have our affection set on things above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. You want to marry someone that that is the case with them, that their affections are heaven, where their aim is heaven, where they're pressing toward that goal. They have that highest aspiration. They have the most perfect intention in life. And that is to live in faithful service to God. That's the kind of person you want to, to, to marry. They have the firmest resolve. And that is to overcome their sins. You're not looking for someone who is perfect because no one is perfect, but you're looking for someone who has resolved in their heart to live for the Lord. And when there is sin and they see it in their lives, they, they repent. Christian parents want their children to marry Christian spouses. Let me tell you, that eases real concern for their direction in life and their destination in eternity. And I want to suggest to all of y'all, those who are engaged, those who are not engaged, to those of us who are already married, that if one's mate loves God first, as Jesus said that this was the first and great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and your mind. If you find a mate that loves God first, they will love you second to no other. They will treat you with the utmost decency and respect and loyalty. I want my spouse to love me but I want her to love God before me. And then I'll be blessed. And so, really as you think about this, this motivation, this valid motivation I believe for matrimony is really comprehensive. It, it covers it all. We could end the lesson right here. But of course, I, I'm not going to do that. I'd like to be a little bit more specific. And here's another valid motivation that this person has given evidence that indicates that they will be a godly parent. That's a valid motivation for matrimony. That may not be what's on the mind of these three couples' children, but eventually it will be. As a parent, one of my greatest concerns in life is the well-being of my children. Physically, yes, I want them to be well off. And I'm not talking about financially necessarily. I'm talking about just physically. But especially spiritually. I want my children to be happy, healthy, but most importantly, I want my children to be holy because that is what God wants for my children. That's what God wants for all of us to be holy people. As Ephesians 1 and verse 4 tells us that just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And as the Hebrew writer said in chapter 12 and verse 14, that we are to pursue peace and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And so yes, I want my children happy. Don't we all? We want them healthy. We don't want them lying in a hospital bed somewhere. We want them, most importantly, holy. And that is my prayer on their behalf. I want them to enjoy life. But I want my children to revel in eternity. 
And it is wonderful that Adrian and I not only share a common faith, but we also share the same concerns and have the same goals as parents for our children. You know, the jingle, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes so-and-so, whoever it is, Neil or Bob, Cameron, with a baby carriage. Marriage and children are closely related. Who you marry will become the parent of your children. And so if marriage is a serious consideration, parenting should be as well. You need good evidence that this person is godly parenting material. Good parenting is not only a daunting task. It is a God-given responsibility. As parents, those of us who are parents, we know that our responsibility is to, to provide and to protect. It is upon us to, to guide and to serve as guardians. And we should be friends and we should be allies to our children. Parents have the task of teaching their children what is good and right. Parents, we need to listen to that. We need to take that seriously. It is our responsibility to teach our children the ways of God. And that's not something new in the New Covenant. But you go all the way back to the Old Covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Moses told the people of God that the things that I have taught you should be in your heart. And then you should teach them diligently to your children when you walk along the way, when you sit down, when you rise up. In, in all of these situations, on all of these occasions, you need to be teaching your children. But before you teach them, it needs to be in your heart. You may be thinking, well, it's, it's going to be a while before I have children. And so I've got a while that... I don't need to worry about any of this. No, you need to be first of all putting the Word of God in your heart right now so that you can teach it to your children when they come along. You have that responsibility. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 tells us to train up a child in the way that he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, Fathers, Bring up your children in the, in the training and the admonition of the Lord. The responsibility is upon us as parents to teach our children what is good and right. It is our responsibility as parents. We have the burden to discipline our children. And no, it's not enjoyable, but it is enjoined upon us. And so we are to discipline our children. And something very important as parents is that we live exemplary lives. We know the Scripture. We've known it since we were children about how we are to let our light shine. Jesus has told us in the Sermon on the Mount that we are the light of the world and that we are to let our light shine where our light needs to shine the brightest when it most definitely needs to be seen is in the home. As parents among our children, they need to be able to look at our lives and see the Lord living in us. We need to be able to say, as the Apostle Paul did, to those he regarded as his children in the Lord, to imitate me as I imitate Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Parental duty is to lead children heavenward and to fail in this. Is for parents and children to fail together. And so I am urging you to marry someone who will accept this responsibility seriously and will fulfill this duty stupendously. We need to marry someone who has shown that as a potential partner they know and they respect their God-given roles. In the home, they're not going to just do what they want to do. They're concerned and they're interested. They care about the roles that God has assigned them in the home. When there are too many chiefs and not enough Indians, the battle's probably not going to end well. My point in saying that is that roles must be respected. You know, understanding what the Bible says regarding roles in the home 
Understanding what it says is really not a difficult endeavor. Applying what the Bible says, that's where the the challenge might be and where the resistance often is. But I think we know what the Bible says. The roles are. God has all authority over all mankind. And God has delegated headship in the home to the man. And by divine decree, wives are to be in subjection to their husbands. You may not like hearing that from me, but you cannot deny that that's what the Scriptures teach. Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the, husband is not the, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What do we learn from that verse? It's very clear. The husband is the head of the wife, and the wife is to submit to the husband she is to be subjected to, in subjection to him. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 that I want you to know that the head of man is Christ and the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. God wants us to know that and to accept that. Men have the grave responsibility of leadership in the home and that, that responsibility must not be shirked. We cannot say, well, I just don't want that. So God has given the men in the home, that responsibility, and they need to accept it. And they need to lead the home in the direction that they should, should follow. Men are to provide for the family. As Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, that if anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel. Men are to be providers for the home and and women are to be the homemakers. They're to be the, the managers of the home. Again, a lot of people don't like that. But it's what the Scriptures teach. They must be respected. And let me qualify this. From what I have said, if there's any concept of oppression or abuse that stems from this role that the man has, that is misguided and should be squelched by the sacrificial and the serving love that is required by the Lord. Not only does Paul say that the, the wives are to be subject to the husband and they're to submit to their husband, but husbands, he says, are to love their wives. And we may think, oh, that's easy. It's easy to love my wife. But that's not all he says. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. There's the real challenge. And anyone, any man who lives up to the love challenge that is demanded by this verse, he's going to be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice on behalf of his wife if necessary. Both husband and wife should respect and honor one another. As Paul would say in the, the same chapter, let the wife see that she respects her husband. And other passages indicate very clearly that the husband is to do the same towards his wife. He is to respect. He is to honor her. He is to lift her up and help her and be a blessing to her. But you know, having understanding of one's roles alone, just knowing the facts, knowing what the Scriptures say and teach regarding roles, that alone is not enough. We've got to apply that. We've got to do what God has given us to do in the roles that He has assigned to us. Wives must not undermine or usurp their husband's role. Neither can the man abdicate his role. Husbands should not denigrate the wife's role. Neither should the wife view her role as inferior. Both partners have tremendous value and the roles that they both have are critical. And both need to know that and understand it. Let me share with you a few tidbits of, of prudence for the man as I have labeled it. 
You know, good leadership in the home is not the ability to make dumb decisions with authority. It is foolish for a man who will not listen attentively and contemplate the wise counsel of his wife. Furthermore, it is not strength of character for a man to tower over his wife condescendingly. Rather, he should elevate her with love and honor. As Adrian would put it, don't bully your weaker vessel. Rather than always making a stand, there's appropriate occasions to take a seat. That is to, to listen, to acquiesce, to yield to her way, to be a peacemaker. It is a selfish man who operates simply to have it his way. And foolish to think that he is the only one who can be right. That's to the man. But now to the woman. Some morsels of wisdom. Showing up your man does not magnify your strengths. Give him honor and respect despite his weaknesses and your strengths. That's what Adrian says she has to do. All my weaknesses, all my faults, yet she has the responsibility to honor and respect me. Defaming him is not going to make you look better. Complaining about your man does not complement your image. It rather detracts from your character. And so women, if you truly want to look good, look good together. Don't try to outshine your man, as Adrian would also put it. Remember that you were created for the man. You know, we're not reminded of that very often, but that is precisely what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 9. That man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And so the women need to remember, I was created for the man. And you need to be the helper in this man's life. Don't hinder him in what is good and right. Be a blessing to him be a crown upon his head. Be a helpmate that God intended for you to be. This is so important. You need to marry someone that you have confidence that this person is a man. They will always remain faithful to you. You know, it is so naive and unreal, uh, unrealistic to envision the perfect mate and the perfect marriage. This is kind of the way I started out. Just trying to make it clear that there will be difficulties. There will be challenges. And that is not pessimistic. That is realistic. In fact, there are times that you, you young couples that are going to get married, there are going to be times that you're going to feel such love and affection for your, your new spouse that you could, you could just eat them up. And there's going to be other times that you're going to be so frustrated and you're going to be so angry at that same person that you're going to wish that you had. Eat no money. That's the way relationships go. There's ups and there's downs. But you need to ask, will this person stay with me? Will they stay with you and stand by you and stay the course even if happiness is hindered? Even if compatibility appears to be challenged, what if health deteriorates? What if finances disappoint? Is this person going to stay with you? You know, circumstances in life and marriage and in marriage don't make you or break you. They reveal who you are. They reveal your, your true character and the character of of your spouse and so choose a mate who has such strength of character they will stay the course through sin. You need to marry someone who knows and they understand that marriage is a permanent relationship. They know and they understand that man did not come up with marriage. That was instituted by God and not only did He institute it, but He regulates it. 
He tells us, He defines for us, this is how the marriage is to be. It is a permanent relationship. It's not in and out and in and out. There were some who came to Jesus and asked Him, can a man divorce his wife for just any reason? And in response to them, Jesus made it very clear that no, that is not the case. He said to them, have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female? and said that for, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And what God has joined together, let not man separate. It is a permanent relationship. And Jesus would go on to say that if a man divorces his wife and marries another, except for the cause of fornication, he commits adultery. It's a sin. And as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, that a husband is not to, uh, to depart from his wife. The wife is not to depart from her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Stated concisely, God's regulation of marriage is that it is one man and one woman for life with one exception. And that is sexual immorality. And so I would encourage you young people, do not ever view divorce as a valid option. Don't ever threaten it. That's foolishness. Don't ever joke about it. It's not funny. In fact, don't even mention it. Keep that word out of your relationship. Keep that word out of your home. Knowing and understanding that the law of God teaches us that marriage is a permanent relationship even though it may be difficult at times. Loyalty and fidelity are of utmost importance in a marriage. You want a mate that you can trust. Lawful marriage, listen to this, lawful marriage, it is the only place sexual intimacy is to be enjoyed. As the wisdom writer would say in Proverbs chapter 5, in verses 15-20, through 20, to drink water out of your own cistern. Let her breast satisfy you always. As the Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews 13 and verse 4, that marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. The fornicators and adulterers, God will judge that. That intimacy when it exists between a husband and a wife, there's nothing impure, there's nothing ungodly about it. But when it is not respected, but a man or a woman, they, they, they go into the bed of adultery or fornication. That's where sin is committed and God's law is violated. And they will be judged. Rebellion against God's law has repercussions, both immediate and distant. Those who enter into adultery cannot enter into heaven. Just to say it in the most concise way. Guys, if you win the attention of a beautiful girl, but she's a floozy and she's a flirt, you don't need her. And no man with dignity or self-worth will tolerate a rival or share his girl. And ladies, if you court the favor of a true Adonis, he's just a handsome fellow. He's got that build. He's got the bulging biceps. He's got the broad chest. He's a handsome man. But he plays the field. He's roving about. He's not worth his weight in dirt. And no lady with moral integrity will stand the stench of his immorality. You want someone you can trust. Someone you don't have to worry about. Where are they at? Or anything of that nature. You know those of you who are contemplating marriage, there are some things I would suggest that you need to resolve. You need to resolve these things for yourself as an individual, for the two of you as a couple, for your marriage, you need to resolve no more 
flirting. You have found your mate. Now you need to focus your attention. You need to focus your affection toward them. You don't share it. You don't give wrong signals to other people. Maybe you think you can handle that, but what about that other person? Maybe they cannot. No more flirting. You need to resolve to avoid compromising situations. And I pray to that end with regard to myself that that God would keep me from a situation where I might ever be tempted to be unfaithful to my wife. Avoid those situations. You need to resolve to limit interaction with those of the opposite sex to safe circumstances. We interact in this building. Men and women, we're interacting with one another. They are, these are safe circumstances. You need to limit whatever that interaction is to those kinds of circumstances. You need to resolve that. Boys and girls who are contemplating, young men and young women who are contemplating getting married. You need to resolve no pornography. Pornography is a pernicious plague that will rob you and cheat you of legitimate <coughs> pleasure and fulfillment in the marriage but that aside, it is sin. The Lord who is Lord of lords and King of kings said that if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her in his heart. It is sin. Get it out of your life if it is there. You need to be like Job. In Job chapter 31 and verse 1 where he said, I've made a, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young maiden? You need to be like the psalmist who would say in Psalm 101 and verse 3 that I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who, who fall away. It shall not cling to me. You need to stay away from those things. Infidelity is the ultimate betrayal in marriage. It is great wickedness and it is foolishness. The proverb writer says that the that the man who commits adultery, he lacks understanding. Choose a spouse that you can celebrate with, not only in marriage, but in distant anniversaries. That silver anniversary, that golden anniversary and beyond. Develop a picture album with that spouse that will extend a lifetime without interruptions and without... Uh, any persons that will reflect sin and immorality and flawed judgment. And I would suggest one other valid motivation for matrimony is this person, well, I'm just convinced that they will live by godly standards morally and doctrinally. Again, I think we see here real incentive for marrying a faithful Christian, not someone who will exasperate incongruity. You know, opposing standards do not mix well in a marriage. They will lead, they may lead to compromise, and Christians cannot compromise on what's right and wrong. We just cannot compromise on what's right and wrong. And so that makes for a real predicament, a battlefield in the home. But what if there are no opposing standards in these areas? Sameness on moral beliefs and practice, it caters to peace in a relationship and consistency in practice. It is impossible for a home to operate peacefully with two opposing standards. Godliness with the one and worldly with the, with the other. These two are bound to collide at one point or another. God calls His people out of darkness. God calls His people away from the world to a life of consecration and distinctiveness. But those who remain in the world, they feel no compunction to live by a higher standard than that which they have set for themselves. And so when you have someone who's living by God's high standard and you have one that's not living by any real standard, they want to do what they want to do and they're bound to do it.
It's going to create problems. This clash between the two is going to surface. It's going to surface frequently when, when moral issues are being discussed in the home. Such as the enforcement of modesty. Such as what movies are we going to allow in the home when you have a man, he's immoral, he don't care, and so he's going to allow these R-rated and these PG-13 movies that are not fit for the Christian home and the Christian man would say absolutely not. And he would remove the abominations out of his home. He would act like a man and he would lead his, his family by example and by word and even by demand if necessary. This will not be tolerated in this home. The husband and the wife, they need to agree on those things. These differences are going to surface when it comes to associations that are allowed and those that are not, that are not tolerated. Even when vacation destinations are discussed, when, when language and humor is occurring in the home. And with regard to alcohol use, I, I think about this. I pity the woman who, as a young woman who was immature, she married this man. And then she maybe became a Christian or she returned to the Lord. She's now living as a faithful Christian and it's time for her to cook dinner. And she goes to the refrigerator and she opens it up and there's a six pack of beer. I pity that woman. Here she's trying to live for God. She's trying to raise her children to respect and to honor God. And she's married this wretched man who does not care. That's a problem. You imagine how that's going to hurt and that's going to crush that woman. You need to be careful about those things. <coughs> Sameness in doctrinal beliefs and practices. It promotes unity and faithfulness to the truth. With unity of belief and practice. We're not talking now about the moral issues that I just gave examples of. I'm talking now about doctrinal beliefs and practices. And how important it is that you believe the same things on these issues. With unity of belief and practices, couples can worship together. And they can work together in service to God. Because I have conviction of faith, because I believe that it really matters what I believe, I find it difficult to imagine intimacy with someone who denies the truth regarding salvation. Or they believe the blasphemous tenets of Calvinism. Or they reject the truth regarding the church or worship or marriage, divorce, and remarriage. How does that work in a home? while maintaining conviction without compromise. You need sameness in these areas of your marriage. Furthermore, marrying someone whose highest goals is to please God, let me tell you, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, it will yield benefits without your effort. You know, that's a big deal. People get married sometimes and they want to change their spouse. And people say, oh, you can't change them. And there may be some truth to that. You can't change them, but God can. And if they are a faithful Christian and they need to change, they're going to change without your effort. When I read in the Scriptures that I need to examine myself and I go on and I read how it, it teaches me that I as an individual, as a man, I need to be more patient. That I need to be long-suffering. That I need to improve my self-control. <coughs> you know, I, I want to do those things not just to improve my marriage, but even before that, I do those things because I want to please God. The Bible teaches us that kindness is a virtue that we should be kind. And it is a blessing in marriage. And you know, I have real motivation to be kind. And it's not just because it's going to make for a better marriage, but it's because I want to please God. <clears throat> and so without any effort on her part, I have motivation 
to be a more kind person. And I'll tell you what she says about kindness. She says, <coughs> kindness and gentleness outshines baldness. I think she means that literally. Because sometimes my baldness shines. But I think she's okay with that. In fact, I'm not even sure she cares what I look like because look at what I look like. But as long as I'm kind, I'm gentle, I'm the kind of man that God wants me to be, as is evident in His Word, she's good with me in that. In, in that. God requires restraint with the tongue. And this is important in marriage. And I want to restrain my tongue. I want to be careful what I say. Not just because I can hurt her. Not just because it can damage my marriage. But because I want to please God. Men, you need to be careful what you say and how you say it. You need to memorize Colossians 4 and verse 6 that tells you to let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you might know how to answer each one. Be careful what you say, and you will be if you're a faithful Christian. You're going to strive to be without her effort. And so you need to find a spouse who they've convinced you, this person has convinced you they will live by godly standards. That's so important. The subject of marriage is so serious. We pointed out that marriage is instituted by God, that it is a permanent relationship, one that God intended to truly be till death do we part. But you know the most important relationship that you'll enter into in life? Well, it's not really the marriage. It's your relationship with God. And that will affect everything else. It's going to affect your marriage and the survival of your marriage. It's going to affect the relationship that you have with your children and whether you will raise them right or not. If you're not in a relationship with God, that's where you need to start. By becoming a Christian by becoming a child of God by believing in Jesus Christ that He is the Son of God and repenting of your sins and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and by being baptized for the remission of sins. And if you've done that in the past but have not been, been faithful, you need to repent. We're going to stand and sing the invitation song. And if you need to make things right, that's the, that's the right time to do it. So I'll stand and sing.